Uh, today uh, we have um, retired high school head coach and athletic director uh, Jim Place. Uh, coach, how you doing? Everything's good. I miss my grandkids, but everything's uh, that's good. Well, oh, I, I mean, as we talked before we, we we started, I mean that's I mean as the joke I made is the point of having great kids is so you can see them and spoil them. So it kind of, kind of sucks. It's unfortunate, but hopefully yeah. that starts changing here soon, coach. Yeah, um, we got to get this grown over. So for, for just so, cause, cause obviously this goes out nationwide and I put it everywhere as we were kind of talking where for people who don't know you or haven't had the opportunity to talk to you, uh, can you guys give a brief background about yourself, kind of your career and kind of how you got to where you are? Sure, Coach. I, I grew up in a town called Massillon, Ohio. Went to Cannon Central Catholic High School. Graduated from there in 1965, 1969 at, at University of Dayton. Um, I uh, have been coaching. I coached for 49 years, 44 of those years as a head coach. About every kind of situation you can imagine. Uh, suburban schools, parochial school, um, uh, inner city schools. I just love coaching and I've stayed somewhat active on the fringe of the coaching for the last three years. So that's basically it. Okay. Uh, what, what kind of made you get into coaching all those years ago, coach? Why did I get into it? Yeah. You know, I knew, I knew in about the seventh grade, I wanted to be a foot, high school football coach. Okay. Uh, you know, growing up in Maslin, uh, football's a big, big deal. And, uh, central Catholic, I love going there. And, uh, I, you know, I, I knew in the seventh grade, I wanted to be a football coach. You know, and, and looking back on it, Nick, uh, I'm now 74 years old. There's no doubt in my mind that God put me on this earth to be a head football coach in a character-driven program, especially dealing with inner-city kids for, for the most part, for a large part of my career. So, you know, it's nice. In the seventh grade, I had a vision, and at age 74, I feel like I am beyond uh, blessed that I was able to do exactly what I was put on this earth to do. Now you mentioned like well, forty four of uh, of your years as a head coach. What where, where were you prior to? Uh, uh, where were you an assistant at prior to becoming a head coach? And then who were kind of your biggest influences to becoming to wanting to follow that path? Well, I was, I was an assistant at two schools: Kettering Alder, worked for Bill Rankin, an experienced coach, and then I worked for Hank Snyder for three years at Dayton and Stebbins. And both of them had an influence on me, but probably more so Hank because Hank let me be a coordinator and. Uh, you know, one thing I would recommend to any young coach is find, find a, a veteran coach and go and learn his system. And uh, then, you know, basically create your own system. But whatever you do, you know, ha have something you believe in. Have something you stand for. And, uh, Hank Snyder, uh, and the amazing thing about Hank is his son, Mike Snyder, is one of my best friends, went into coaching. His grandson, Lance Snyder, is now head football coach in Miamisburg. So those two were my mentors, especially Hank. Awesome, Coach. Kind of where I wanted to head next because I, I think anybody that knows of you or knows you knows how much you're involved in character development and leadership development um, and how much how much of a priority you put onto that. Um, and the first thing I want to kind of go into is what did you learn as a head coach? And, and this could be a very long answer and there's about a billion different ways you can go with this, but what did you learn of about becoming a head coach that you could pass along to people who are interested in becoming head coaches. Um, and what is kind of, I think, I think in your opinion, kind of the biggest misunderstandings uh, of becoming a head coach? Well, the very first thing is this, Nick, uh, about oh, 20 years ago, maybe, maybe 22, 23 years ago, I started something called a philosophy book. It started with, <clears throat> excuse me, 16 pages, and I wrote down, these are the things I believe in. This is the way I want to run a program. And what I did was, for those remaining years I was a head coach, the night before two-a-days, we had a meeting, and with my staff, I ran through that entire 16 pages. And we went through it point by point, and I said, listen, these are the things that I believe in. If you're on board, please, let's go out tomorrow, and let's go on the same page. If you're not on board, you know what? You, you and I are probably not going to get along, as simple as that. And, and do me a favor. You still have time to quit. And I'll help you. There'll be no hard feelings. They'll help you find another job. But let's not get in a situation where we're going to struggle for a whole year because we're just not on the same page. And none of the things in that 16 uh, pages dealt with 
X's and O's, offense and defense. I, I'll work with anybody on that. You know, I've hit some few bumps with a couple of guys on my staff. But the basic thing is, this is how we treat young men. Well, that philosophy book over the next 20 some years has grown to be 80 pages. Every single time that I go to a clinic, if I hear a homily at church, if I read something and I say, you know what, that's something I believe in. It's probably already in my philosophy book, but it's a different way of saying it, a different way of looking at it. I add it. So now it's 80 pages. So when you ask me what I would recommend to any young man, a person becoming a coach, either assistant coach or head coach, I'd recommend at the earliest age possible start a philosophy book. Know what you stand for. You know, the, the, a couple of things, other things about that philosophy book, Nick, it is. Uh, I read the entire book twice a year just for the sake of reading it. Now, when I was still coaching it, anytime I had a problem, I would sit down and I'd read my philosophy book. Anytime a coach would call me and, and say, Coach Place, you got advice for me? I'd say, you know what? Let me tell you what's in my philosophy book. Whether it's right or wrong, I'm not saying my philosophy was the right way of doing it. It was right for me. And I knew this. If I did things according to my philosophy, I could put my head on the pillow at night. Regardless of how things went or what the problem was, I'd say, you know, I'm true to myself. This is the way you treat young men. I, put them I found that the problem was that, you know, the theory is great and having a philosophy, but reality is you don't always put it into practice. And I found that the biggest problem is I look back and go, you know what, I wasn't true to who I am. I wasn't true to my philosophy. So I, I guess the main thing to reiterate this I would recommend any coach start a philosophy book. Know who you are. Know what you stand for. Review it every year. You know what? If you want to change, say, you know what? I don't believe in that anymore. This isn't something that I am. I, I, I'll give you an example of that. I don't believe in cutting young men. In other words, I, I've had some coaches that say, you know what? We got to cut him. He's bad for the team. He's this, he's that. I don't cut young men. I never have. Now, there are times that young men cut themselves. So in other words, if you draw a line in the sand and say, listen, these are your actions. These are your consequences. Now, it takes me a whole lot of lines in the sand before I say, I'll cut you. There's suspensions. There's this. There's meeting with the parents. There's, I mean, I'll walk, I'll draw many, many lines in the sand. But when you hit that last line and you say, listen, if you do this one more time, you can't be in a program anymore. Or sometimes there's actions that are so severe. Every action has to have a consequence that, you know, the action itself says, you, you've lost the right to be in the program. But just to cut a young man for the sake of saying, you know, we really don't want you in the program, I've never done that. I've had a couple coaches on my staff that, that and, and, and that's fine. It was their philosophy. They said, listen, we've got to get rid of some of these guys because they're bad for the program. We just didn't get along. And, and, and it's no, it wasn't like I didn't like the coach. They didn't like me. So at the end of the year, we both looked at each other and said, hey, you know, this is isn't working out, is it? I said, no, you know, I, I wish that the night that we had that meeting, the day before two days started, that we both would have realized that you would have gone your way, coach somewhere more in philosophy and, and everything would have been better. So that's my main advice, I think. Start a philosophy book. Okay, coach, and, and kind of continue from there. At what point in your career did you realize that culture and leadership were more important than X's and O's? Well, I don't know what point, Nick, but I don't. I think that there was never a point where that belief kept getting stronger. Even in my last year of coaching, I, I, I became more committed to the fact that, hey, listen, if you're going to stay in this profession and it's all about winning and losing, you are not going to make it. I mean, you're going to at some point, you're going to hit a point where you're going to lose and, and you know, you're going to get frustrated. You're going to get out of it. When you're in this profession, if it's all about you, it's not going to work. Uh, for, I think every year I progressed more. I probably started a very basic belief with that, but every year I bought into it more and more and more. And finally, at the end of my career, I would say I was so committed to honestly believing that the, the thing that really mattered the most is helping young men, working with them, developing a culture, developing a character program. Uh, I guess if I went back to coaching, it would be even stronger commitment. You know, the funny thing is, it's like anything else. You spend all your life uh, trying to perfect your profession, and then it's time to retire once you reach a level that you really feel comfortable with. Okay. Now, um, is there a moment? And because I, I I let a couple of coaches know I was going to talk to you this week, and they sent me eighteen thousand uh, questions themselves. Um, so, but is there a, is there a moment that like sticks out to you that you're proudest of during your tenure? over the 40 plus years of your coaching? Well, you know, that's a tough question. We won a state championship in 2002. 
And you know what? To any coach that's ever won a state championship, it's the ultimate professional goal, not personal goal, but it's the ultimate professional goal to be state champions. And so I, I, that definitely would stick out. You know, but, you know, I can also, I coach my own son. That has to be a highlight. You know, I coached teams where my daughters were in the school. I enjoyed that almost as much as, as coaching my son. That, you know, in the same category because we shared that experience together. So I, I would say winning a state championship and then coaching uh, the opportunity where I could share it with my family. Uh, and so with a, those were big things. But then I think of all the young men I've coached. I mean, I could just go through a list of this young man, that young man, young man. I said, that was a highlight. Coaching that young man was a highlight. And there are just so many of them. You know, one thing that I believe in, Coach, I, I think I believe in winning little battles. So an example was my last coaching position was the head coach at Dayton Poets, which is a Dayton public high school, an inner city high school. And uh, I, myself and six other coaches went in there. We didn't take a salary. We gave our salary to, to younger coaches and simple as that. And uh, we took over a program and won uh, six games in the previous six years. It was, the school was only in existence, eight games. Eight games in the six years of existence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they had 18 players. And our whole philosophy was, let's win little battles. The same everywhere. Because we, we're not going to change the city of Dayton. We're probably going to have an extremely minimal effect on Dayton Public Schools. We thought we could have some effect upon Ponitz High School. But we knew we could have an effect upon the, we, we got up to 80. We got the 80 young men in the program. And what I mean by win little battles is there's some of those 80 young men that really bought in. And really and truly, the football program is a major factor in their lives and who they are. And, uh, you know, there's three, four, five, six of those, seven of those every year. But we think for every young man in the program, we're going to have some kind of an impact. So win little battles is a huge piece of advice. Now, what would you attribute to that, especially at an a inner city school like that, what would you attribute to that number increase from the 18 to the 80 that you had well, a lot, lots of reasons. Number one, we brought in a great staff. I mean, the staff was great. But the one thing I, I really believe in, kids want to play football. In other words, if you, if you walk through the halls of the school and said, you know, and all of you that have physical ability, who wants to play football, they all want to play. But very few of them don't want to play. But there are reasons to stop them from playing. So what you got to do is find out, well, what's the reason to stop them from playing and try to eliminate those if, if, if you want these young men on the team. Example is, uh, you know, I want to play football, but I'm basketball. I'm baseball. Well, one of the things I always believed in there, I was the coach of the game. I said, you give me your basketball schedule, you give me your baseball schedule, I'll work around it. I mean, whatever it takes, I'm never going to put you in the middle between two. I'm going to make it possible for you not only to play both sports, but be rewarding for you to play both sports. So we did that. But I think the best example is this, Nick. Any of, anyone listening to this has ever worked in, in, a, in an urban school or inner city school knows this. Those with the greatest needs get the least resources. There are so limited resources in the inner city schools, it's just not fair. And the best example I can give you is this. When I was the head football coach at Dayton Ponis, the Dayton public school students, grades seven through 12, had to pay for their own bus. If you went to the Silver Ember School, Centerville, Beaver Creek, Fairborn, all these schools, they all bust their kids. They bust them in. Dayton public schools, one of the greatest need, did not bust them. A family would have to pay $60 a month for their son or daughter to go to school. Well, quite obviously, they couldn't afford it. Now, I look back on the grades the year before I came to Ponis, 44% of failures were in the first period. Why? They weren't there. In other words, not only could they, if they had to afford to pass, but they had to switch buses at the downtown uh, station and then bus over to uh, Ponis and back to the downtown station and then out to their homes. Well, it took forever, and they missed their, missed their connections. All kinds of problems were caused by the fact they couldn't get to school. So I was at a point in my career where I had some resources here in town, and I went to one of those people, and I said, listen, would you buy 100 bus passes for four months? It cost a lot of money. Uh, RTA gave us a very good deal, though, so uh, we, we got off pretty well on it, but it still cost a lot of money. This donor said, yeah. I said, listen, here's what it's going to produce. As soon as everyone heard we were giving free bus passes, and they were good 724, that uh, for those four months, the kids could ride the buses wherever they wanted to. They came to school. Well, right away, we jumped up in numbers up to 80. Now, there were other factors, but that was the number one factor, is we removed one of those barriers. You know, it, it, it was, if you're going to coach an inner city school, it would like to compare it to. Picture a 100-yard dash. You take a young man who's, who's playing out in, say, a, a, a suburban school, he's got to run the 100-yard dash. 
We put a young man in an urban school. He's got about six hurdles he's got to jump over just to get to the team. He's got all the transportation, uh, the situation at home, uh, the, the situation in the school. Take those hurdles off. Do as much as you can to take those off. Some, sometimes the, the, the situation is the, the uh, school district's not cooperative in hiring assistant coaches. Go ahead and get your own coaches. Take the hurdle off. Get the transportation. So that's the main advice. Okay. Now, I, I kind of want to head in a slightly different direction next. Um, and, and assuming this is my research doing correctly, um, you you are an adjunct at the University of Dayton, if, I, if I'm correct on that. Uh, and you te- teach a leadership class. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, kind of what that entails, why you started it? I'd be glad to, Nick. You know, I, I'm very fortunate. I played football at the University of Dayton. It's one of the most uh, things I'm most proud of in my life. I'm many things, but that's one of them. I'm very proud of the fact I played football at the University of Dayton. My academic advisor at the University of Dayton was a professor I stayed close to all my life. He ran a program for educators to come in and take workshop credits. Uh, when he ended his career, he said, Jim, why don't you take it over, but adjust it to what you do, which is character education. So today I have that program. I have 12 different classes that an educator can take. They can take them for three graduate credits each. Um, and they come in for one day, and then we give them assignments. Or now that we're online, they watch six hours of video, and then we give them assignments. But they're all they're, uh, some of the classes that we offer there is positive strategies to prevent bullying. Huge issue. I really think we can change society if everybody will get on the same page with, with stop bullying. Uh, working with students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, huge issue. Incorporating community service in your classroom, developing a good attitude. So there's 12 different classes dealing with all different aspects of um, character education, as simple as that, all coming under that one umbrella. And I'm very proud to say that over the last 12 years that we've had over 6,000 students take one of those classes. Uh, and it's fun. I mean, it, well, the nice thing about it is I don't talk about any theories. There are no theories in my classes. Uh, in my class, I have a lot of guest speakers and myself, and we start out by saying, this is what I do, or this is what I've done, and how I do it, and this is what you can do on Monday when you go back to school. So it's all practical through the University of Dayton. You know, it keeps me close. Yeah, yeah, I, there's one thing that I believe in. I want to die exhausted. I mean, I hope I'm still teaching those classes uh, uh, right up to, uh, I say, you know, get the old man out of there he's crazy i want to die exhausted i want to continue to be involved and and, and do everything at 100 percent as simple as that you know i i'd go back to coaching tomorrow except there's two reasons to stop him number one i'd never take i hope i would never take a, a, a coaching job away from the you know, from young coach who has prepared himself and you know i was 26 at one time and just foaming at the mouth being head coach and all of a sudden he finds out oh, they hired a 74 year old coach ahead of me I, I, you know i've had my run so the last two jobs I've taken, both situations, there were situations where there really wasn't uh, a candidate that they were willing to hire. And so that was the case. And then number two, we're split vote in our house. You know, uh, my vote is keep coaching. Uh, my better <laughs> half vote is, is the other way. And the other half probably is a little stronger in, in that vote. But I, I'd go back to coaching tomorrow. And who knows, maybe I will. <laughs> Hey, you're not the only coach I've talked to recently that has, has that comment, or, or, or the, the other half is somewhat opposed. Or I got the greatest coach in the wife, but remember, I, I mean, I, I did it for 48 years, so it's yeah. not like she didn't pay her dues, and, uh, you know, we've got 10 grandchildren, we want to see them. Oh, yeah, no, I, I get you 100%, Coach. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, I, I, one of the other questions that was kind of sent to me is, and I'm, I'm going to read it word for word and kind of let you yeah. react from there, is... Um, Coaches, coaching is teaching. Did you enjoy teaching your assistant coaches as much as you enjoyed t- teaching your players? Uh, yeah, I, I was, uh, for the assistant coaches, I don't know whether I, I really say I taught them. I, I enjoyed the tremendous relationship with 90% of my assistant coaches. You know, we, I didn't get it off all of them. I'll be very bluntly. There was someone where we, we just didn't get along that well. But yeah, <laughs> 90%. Here's something that, that I still enjoy. I have a list of 61 either former assistant coaches of mine or players of mine are coaching now. I send them two emails a year, two emails. I say, hey, listen, whether you want it or not, here's a bit of advice from the old man or wish them all luck. So that relationship is very important. I still love all those guys. So, uh, you know, I don't know whether it is teaching it or not. I think the main thing is that, that, that I try to develop with my assistant coaches in the past is, listen, here's my philosophy. We're going to do it my way. If you're coming in the front, I'm not talking about X's and O's. I, 
That's not my specialty. You know, I, I will try to bring in coaches to supplement my weaknesses. Uh, so I know nothing about the passing game. Um, this this part, of the, that part of the game, kicking. We got you got to hire a good kicking coach. As simple as that. But I do know this: I have philosophy on how to run a program. When, when you're in the when, when you're in the, my program, the assistant coach, I expect you to buy into that. Now, when you go on to your own program. Then you start your own philosophy, and it can be 100% different. You know, I, I go out and see some of the successful co coaches, Nate Moore at Maslin, Chip Auden up at Coldwater. I can go on and on and on. Marcus Colvin and CJ with the, the coaches. And 14 of my guys now are head coaches. Mark Waits over in Indiana. And they've all, I look at their, their philosophies, all, I see some resemblance to my program, but I know this. They develop their own philosophy. So when I say teaching, what I really think is this. When you're in my program, do it my way. But the whole time, be taking notes. When I become a head coach, here's how I'm going to do it. Just as simple as that. Um, you know, and, and I wasn't great for, for uh, blending ideas. I had a philosophy. You know, if, if one man can paint a house in one hour, two men can paint the house in two hours. Sometimes you combine <laughs> philosophies. It doesn't always work out quite as well as you think. We pretty much got a philosophy yeah. in the program. Now, extras and O's, you know, I, I, that wasn't my specialty. You can argue about that all you like. I'm not crazy about X and O guys. You know, when I interviewed assistant coaches, if I thought he was in the X and O guy, you know, I expect them to be a specialist in their area and this, that, and the other thing. But guys that really and truly, you almost sense the guy. A guy says, I coach because I love X's and O's. He probably wasn't going to be happy in my program because we're not going to sit around and talk about X's and O's. I mean, the offensive and defense coordinator make, make game plans. You can have input on it, but you're doing it the way the coordinator said. Yeah. Okay? No, I, I get it 100%, coach. And then, that, I mean, that was fantastic. Um, now, I kind of got a slightly different question. Because earlier I asked about um, your proudest, mo proudest moment. And, that, and that's a, that's a double-edged sword in itself. Um, but I, I did also want to ask, do you have, like, a favorite memory? Like, something that just, oh. like, I mean, obviously the state championship. That's, that's again, professionally, for, that's, that is a pinnacle. But is there, like, something... And that you can't tell, because obviously there's some stories as, as coaches we can't, can't re, re, re say yeah. on, on a live situation. Yeah. But is there something you're like, that, that was fun? Let me throw out some memories. So here's one. I'm a head football coach at Springfield Northwestern High School. So uh, I'm 28 years old. That's what, 50, 40 some years ago. Mm -hmm. I had a young man on the team that was, we only had about 35 players on the team, but a young man was a senior. He's a second team player. He wasn't a very good player. And even he knew that. He ran scout team and, and practice, and he got beat on every single day. One player in particular really beat on him. Just, you know, if I, if I look back on it now, he said, what would you change? I would have stopped that because I knew it was happening. It was probably bullying. Well, one day in practice, this young man who, who was the second team senior, the play ended. The other man was walking back to the huddle. He came and blasted him, knocked him right on the ground. And, of course, I screamed at him, what are you doing? You know, how can you do that? If you did that in a game, it would hurt our team. And it did, it, you understand he didn't do the team any good. And I looked at him, you know what he said to me? He said, Coach, you may not did the team any good, but did me a heck of a lot of good. <laughs> and you know what? That, that young man has gone to become an attorney. And I see him once in a while. I say, you know what? I've talked about you for 45 years. As simple as that. And what did that teach me all those years ago? I think you always have to look at things through the eyes of your players. You know, I was looking at things through the eyes of me and the team and everything else. That's good. But also, you've got to look at things through the eyes of your players. How do your players see, see these? How do your players see you? Way back 45 years ago, that incident affected me. You know, another, I'll tell you one other same thing that happened. The year we won the state championship. The year before we made the final four, we lost on the last play of the game. The young men who were seniors came in my office during the 30-day dead period said, Coach, we're going to win a state championship. I said, well, I, I've told you how. Don't totally buy into character. You buy into character, everything else will take care of itself. That senior class had 26 seniors. Only 12 of them started. We had a tremendous group of underclassmen. I spent 14 of them didn't start. But not, the amazing thing about that is for the offseason, so the seven months offseason in the grade book, I had three things. I put a check if you were there. I put an E if you're excused. I put a circle if you uh, just missed, all right? The 26 seniors during the entire off season, of course, to carry over the season, not one circle. So that's amazing, not one excuse. But here's what really made it amazing, not one E. Not one player went on vacation. If they had a doctor's appointment, they never scheduled it during workouts. 
They never missed a workout. There wasn't one circle or eight. Every senior was at every workout. That's why when I was standing on the 50-yard line of Paul Brown Stadium, probably 30 or 40 media members there, and they said, Coach Blazers, this is the greatest moment of your life. And I said, well, you know, I've got my wife and three children with me. No, it's not the greatest <laughs> moment of my life. But it's the greatest moment of my professional life. Yeah. And then I looked over at those young men, and, I, and, and, and it just hit me, just like a ton of bricks. They did this. That day they walked in their office that they said, we're going to do what it takes to become state champions. You know another part of that story is? They said, Coach Place, we want something from you. I said, don't worry about character. We'll take care of it. You're not going to be a coach. There's not any the character problems on a team. There's not going to be character problems in school. And we have 380 males in the school, 120 who play football. I saw and I, Julianne, the year we won the state championship. And so they dominated the school. That's what made the whole thing fun. But they said, do two things for us, Coach. Number one, Every time that you go to draw the practice schedule up, draw and rip it up in that 20 more minutes. Push us harder than you ever pushed. Next thing is when you do conditioning, coach, when you're going to put your whistle in your mouth, then conditioning, put it down and run us some more. Push us harder than you can think is possible. That was hard because we pushed them hard to start out with, but I did it. And that's also why when I looked at that team, you know, uh, on December 2nd, 2002, they just won a state championship. I thought that's how you win state championships. You know, everybody's got pretty good talent. You get to that final stages there, but what teams have that magic they're willing to do what the other teams aren't? That's awesome, Coach. That, 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 that is awesome. And, and then um, I, I was told to ask you this question. This was sent to me as well. Okay. And, and I'm, again, I'm going to read it verbatim. And it says, how was it coaching at both Middletown and Hamilton, one of the greatest rivalries in Ohio? I coached at both schools. You know, I, I coached at Middletown and I came back, uh, I think it was 15 years later, coached with the Big Blue, so they didn't know each other. You know what? It, 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 I love Ohio high school football. I mean, it, it, it's just something that's very, very important to me, not just where I coach, but all of Ohio high school football. And one of the great things about Ohio high school football is you have a lot of one high school towns, Middletown, Maslin, Warren, Steubenville, Troy. It goes on and on on Sydney, pick one. Where their school is the same, and the name of the school is the same as the town. Mm -hmm. Middletown and Hamilton, Mansfield, Portsmouth. It goes on and on and on. All these great towns. And one thing they have in common, boy, they love high school football. They love high school football in all those towns. Hamilton and Middletown were the epitome of those. Now, Middletown, when I was there, the Armco was rolling brick steel. It was going great guns. The tradition was overwhelming. And I'll talk a little bit about Middletown. What I loved about Middletown was this. I had a problem with a young man. I'd call him, and, and, and the MIDI tradition was so strong. I said, listen to me. Who in your family was a MIDI? Oh, my dad, my uncle, maybe my grandpa. But all of them had somebody. Uh, you know, it's not that big. I said, well, listen, they were MIDIs. You're not a MIDI. I said, get out of my office. You're still on a team, but I'm not calling you a MIDI. The young man would come back and say, coach, I'm sorry. I understand. I don't want to be a MIDI. I mean, they were the easiest kids to motivate. They played their hearts out. The town got behind it. Coaching in Middletown was great. Coaching in Big Blue was the same thing, man. They loved being part of that Big Blue. We talked about Big Blue pride and tradition, mini pride and tradition. And, and the, the nice thing about that was, I mean, their dads, their granddads, those one high school towns, they have tremendous tradition. And, and it, it means something to the young men. It means something to the town. And I, I think that if you're a coach coaching in one of those towns, the very first thing you got to do is buy into that tradition and get your men to buy into it. So that that point of saying you're not a midi breaks their heart. You don't have to say you don't have to yell, scream at them. You're not a midi, young man. Come back when you're a midi. So I love coaching both those places and so many great memories, so many friends. I see those young men all the time. You know, one thing about those midis, you talk about tight. Oh my gosh, <laughs> you took on a midi or a big blue. You took on yeah. one, you took on all. As simple as that. That, that's that that is that's fantastic, coach. And I'm glad I was sent that question. I have one more thing before, with you before we go. Um, and, and me and you have emailed a little bit back and forth about taking a head coaching job and some of that stuff. Um, you sent you sent me a list, which I've skimmed over probably about seven times already the other day. Um, and it, it talked about the first 30 days. And what, what do you think is like the most important thing for somebody to do in that first 30 days once they get their head coaching job? Okay, well, let's talk about interviewing for a head coaching job. Then I'm going to talk about that okay. list. When you interview for a head coaching job, you got to realize you're going against other people who want that job just as bad as you do. You have to do one thing in your interview. When you turn and get off that chair and walk through the door, they got to say, that's our head coach. 
You have to project that image because if you don't, somebody else isn't. So no matter what you said, no matter how good a job, no matter what your record, if you get up and walk out of that chair and they don't go, that's our coach, you're out. That's not going to happen. So one of the things that you have to do in that interview is everything you do project, I'm the coach. Don't say if I get the job. Don't say when I get the job. So I say this, I am going to have it. When I'm the head coach, this is what's going to happen. When you put your stationery together, put their school logo on the top of everything. So that everything they say you do in that interview creates the impression, this is our head coach. Now, you may not be the only one that can. So they said, oh, we got two or three good candidates. We like them all. But they got two or three go, you know, they, 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 we, I don't picture it. I don't see it. So one of the things, that, and, and uh, I send this to the, the coaches, Nick, and any coach out there that wants it, I'll send it to you. I put together what I, I think a head coach should do in the first 30 days. Day one, day two, uh, week one, week two. And I, it goes through everything from scheduling your scrimmages to transportation, uh, who to meet with. Meet with the super, meet with the AD, um, uh, meet with the principal, of course, and say, what, what, what are your expectations for me? What are the things I need to know to make you uh, think I'm doing a good job? So I got a whole list of things. You know, contact the youth organization. Of course, obviously, interview every coach on the present staff. Even though a coach says, I don't want to come back, sit down and interview him. And say, what can you tell me? You know what? Don't ever ask a coach, uh, a coach on the present staff, what problems do we have? You'll know those. If you walk in and see there's a bad weight room, they don't have to hear that. If, if, if you say, you know, you had 18 kids on the team, you know that. Tell me what's good. Find out what's good in the program. So that, you, that way you can stay positive. You don't have to run anybody down. So I've got a whole list. Now, tell that in the interview. So all of a sudden, it's not like, I wonder what he'll be as a head coach. You're telling them, here's what I'm going to do in the first 30 days of this position. You're creating that vision of yourself. So, Nick, that's why I sent it to you, and I sent it to all my guys. Uh, and I'll send it to any coach that wants it. Um, it, it's a list of things. This is what I'm going to do in the first 30 days <coughs> as that coach. You're creating that vision of who you are to that interviewing committee. Awesome coach. Um, I will put coach, uh, places, contact information in the bio for anybody that wants to get a hold of him. Um, coach, sure. coach, coach is a fantastic guy. Um, he does a lot of stuff with our local coaches association as well. Um, I, Oh, I actually almost forgot that. Thanks. That actually reminded me. Because I want to talk to you about that before we have it. I think it's next month. I want to say, because yeah. you were working with the Miami Valley Football Coach Association on an initiative and um, to help uh, with coaches, coaches, coaches social coach, justice. Yeah, coaches and social justice. Do you want to kind of explain that real quick? What you're working on? Sure, Coach. After the situation up in Minnesota, I was at, at driving in my car with my wife, got a call from a great friend of mine named Coach Al Powell. And anybody from the Dayton area knows, he's got a twin brother, Alfred and Albert Powell. I mean, they're legendary Dayton coaches, a great, a great ride at Dayton Dunbar, very well known all over town, but especially in West Dayton. Coach Powell called me up and said, Coach, I'm sick. So what's happening in America today is that I'm just sick about this, that, and everything else. He said, Coach, and of course, he knows my philosophy. We, we talk often. We, he and I have put on little seminars together for different schools sometimes. And uh, he said, Coach, let's do something. I said, Coach, I'm so sick that I, I didn't call you. Why didn't I think of that? Okay. So we said, we're going to do something. And we said, first, let's do it through our association. So let's not just you and I do it, Coach Powell. Let's do it. And, and I want to say this. It's all his idea. Coach Powell called me. He says, here's my ideas. I said, Coach, I'll take them and run with them. And then here's my ideas. And we go from there. So what we want to do is do this. We want to promote in Miami Valley high school football community, the whole 65, 70 schools that come rise the Miami Valley football community as, as great an understanding of social justice as we can create things that are going to happen in a positive manner. What does diversity mean? What does racial justice mean? What does racial understanding mean? All of these things we can improve. All of us can improve in this area. So that, uh, so that a, a football player out in, out in uh, Germantown, a football player in Ansonia, knows more about a young man in Dayton Public Schools, knows more about a young man uh, out, out in Wayne High School, knows more about a young man at Chaminade Julian High School, all about racial diversity. What can we do to promote it? What, coaches, what can we do to get coaches to understand it? And then they'll go to their players. So with that in mind, on January 28th, we're going to have a webinar. And Sinclair Community College has stepped up and provided all the technical support on that. It's going to be first class, so how we do it. And what we're going to do is we have asked eight different people 
to deliver somewhere between a five and an eight minute presentation talking about this is what social justice means to me. This is what diversity means to me. And then they're going to say, this is one thing that I can recommend that every coach listening to this webinar can do. So we're, uh, we, we've got high school coaches. We've got a coach from the Bengals. We've got a coach from the University of Dayton. We've got Marcus Freeman, who's the defense coordinator at uh, the University of Cincinnati, who's a Wayne graduate of Ohio State, All-American, of course. And uh, so we've got a, a variety. We've got a, a, a police officer, a Bob Shabalas, who's head of Dayton SWAT, uh, t totally committed to, the, to what we believe in. So they're going to talk. Then uh, groups, uh, coaches will be put in groups of eight. Uh, Sinclair has the technical ability to do that. And they'll talk for about 45 minutes. And then each group is going to send us one suggestion. This is what we think that we can do to make the, the, the Miami Valley, uh, in our small world, with little battles, the greatest place in the world for racial justice, for understanding each other, for promoting, uh, you know, we're all the same in God's eyes. So I'm excited about it. I'm thrilled that Al Powell asked me to do it. It's his program. I'm helping him. And uh, I hope every coach in the Dayton area logs on and becomes part of that. I, I, I would be, um, uh, I don't know what negative word I want to use. I don't want to stay over from being negative. If some school district chose not to participate yeah. in that. Because we need, every, I mean, if, if, if every school district in the Dayton area, we need to join together and make this a joint effort. So I hope every coach in the Dayton area joins into the webinar. Well, and thank you for to talk about it no, no problem coach that's part of the reason why i wanted to have you on and for some reason it just slipped my mind maybe because i was staring at the thirty thousand questions that mike mckenna and matt bartley sent me um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so no, no. And, and like i said um if anybody's interested in more information on that again his contact information will be below i will also right. suggest if you or you can also contact the miami valley football coach association exactly. either one either one and they will provide the information for you um, and same thing if you if you don't know if you can't get a hold of either one of them just send me and I will forward that information I have no problem doing that um, I am all, all for that and um, I look forward to attending that uh, next month um, coach, Great, coach I, I want to thank you um, for your time tonight I appreciate it um, and again if anybody wants to reach out to coach um, see his information below.